having heard the curriculum vitae of Ma Michael Battle already once today, he does not need quite so much of an introduction from me as we welcome and invite him to give the Cheney Lecture. But I do want to remind us of the fact of the Cheney Lecture and the commemoration that it represents. The Cheney Lecture is usually given in alternate years, alternating with the Pitt Lecture, in honour of Francis Xavier Cheney, one time professor at Yale Divinity School and director of development for Berkeley. It was given in an effort to continue his example of transcending doctrinal and vocational differences to focus on the care of the whole people of God. That's a quote from the indenture for the lecture. You can see why it may have seemed particularly appropriate for us to invite Michael Battle to think about these themes because of his demonstrated commitment to working through the spirit of Ubuntu. Dr. Battle uh, joins an illustrious group. Previous lecturers for the Cheney Lecture have included John Macquarie, Madeleine Lengel, Krista Stendel, Krista Tippett, Jane Shaw, and most recently, Jenny Tepa Daniel. It therefore gives me great pleasure to call upon Reverend Dr. Michael Battle to give the Cheney Lecture for 2022. Welcome, thank you. To Dean McGowan and the trustees, and to all of you who have gathered, it's a wonderful honor to receive this wonderful degree. And to Dr. Alexander, and to Professor Street, who has passed away, what a wonderful community to belong with. And thank you to my wife, Raquel, who is here always supporting me. It's you can't really make it without someone who can be there in the trenches with you. It's also good, as I was walking with Dean McGowan, to see my picture on the wall for the class of 1990. I was the only one with no coat or tie. So that will give you some reflection of what I am like. I want to talk with you about three things, all related to a book I am writing called Ubuntu as an Atonement Theology. So in the first, I'd like to be a little autobiographical and explain how I was converted to an Ubuntu worldview. And second, I'd like to argue for why Ubuntu and Christian spirituality belong together. And third, I'd like to get into more of an explicit explanation for why Ubuntu and atonement theology belong together. So first, why I converted to an Ubuntu worldview. When I was in first grade in 1970, I was bused an hour each way to Sherwood Bates Elementary School in Raleigh, North Carolina. Like a fish that does not know it's wet, my seven-year-old self did not know I was swimming in racism. My first grade year at Sherwood Bates was the beginning of school integration between city and county public school systems. And later when I was in high school in 1982, my dearly beloved elementary school, Sherwood Bates, closed its doors to become part of Daniel's Middle School. As I look back, the pain resurfaces that I had something to do 
with Sherwood Bates closing. Namely, for some, my black body caused entropy, the gradual decline of the value of Sherwood Bates and the value of the houses surrounding Sherwood Bates. In 1982, my home of a school in which I first became a student closed. For those who saw entropy in my existence, for them, they understood, and those subsequent generations who agreed with them, that they understood that children like me brought contamination. And although my seven-year-old self had no clue what was going on, I knew that something was wrong as I grew up in a school system that manufactured pseudo-desegregation. And next door, next door to my beloved elementary school sat Josephus Daniels Middle School. And this was a wonderful school for me as an elementary school student because I loved to play flag football and wander into Daniels because they actually had a football field. And so, as I got to know both Sherwood Bates as a seven-year-old and Daniels Middle School, I understood that there was this beautiful, utopic, way of being a student. But since 1982 till today, I see that I actually caused entropy for that utopia. And Daniels became a school also in jeopardy. During the COVID pandemic, an incident in North Carolina which had long been misrepresented as a black riot in Wilmington, North Carolina, occurred in terms of the focus of what actually happened. It turned out to be actually a white riot. And on November 10th, 1898 in Wilmington, North Carolina, White supremacists organized the Wilmington Massacre. Of course, the white supremacists did not see this as some kind of massacre. They saw this as justice, as they committed a violent overthrow of a duly elected government of both black and white officials who believed in integration, organized white mobs forced out elected officials at gunpoint and burned and looted homes, property, and businesses of black citizens as they attempted to build lives and communities after the end of slavery. At least 60 black people died that day. And here is where we go back to a fish doesn't know it's wet. The massacre was the result of an uprising of white terrorists incited to action by Josephus Daniels, the owner of the Raleigh newspaper, The News and Observer and an anti-black propaganda campaign organizer using the newspaper to encourage white terrorism against black people. It was, it was focused on violent voter suppression and election fraud in concert with another, Charles Acock, also a school named after him, and the school that the popular satirist David Sedaris went to. In 2019, the News and Observer that 
Josephus Daniels founded ran an article detailing his role in this horrific incident and that he did and instigated and the irony that this occurred, this recent way of understanding the Wilmington massacre brought to the surface how no student could receive a publicly funded education now under the Daniels name and the glorification of white supremacy. So too Daniels Middle School has changed. During the COVID pandemic, the world reached another tipping point in history. And that was especially in the renaming of many schools, monuments, but also with what the Black Lives Matter movement did in response to George Floyd's death. Atonement was needed for this viral tipping point that continued to wreak havoc in the world for how people could see the world that they were actually swimming in. The sins of white supremacy could not continue to be celebrated while at the same time have the truth buried in misplaced nostalgia and denial. My neighbor growing up, Karen Green, called for the removal of the Daniels name from Daniels Middle School in order to end the practice of this glorifying racism and the violence against black people. And now Daniels is called the Oberlin community, named after former slaves. When I was in seventh grade, moving now to 1977, I attended what is still called today Carnage Middle School. As you can see, I had bad luck with the names <laughs> of the schools that I went to. I recall walking back to homeroom, which was a system in public schools to check on students' whereabouts, to hear school announcements over the intercom, to listen to the principal praise and curse student behavior and here's student council announcements about Girl Scout Samoya cookie, Cookies, which also has changed its name to Caramel Delights. <laughs> homeroom held students accountable for anything school related. And so my homeroom teacher, Mrs. Crutchfield, a pensive white woman, probably in her 30s, for me, she was memorable for two reasons. First, she was my language arts teacher who complimented me on my short story about a poor black boy who could only buy a bicycle and could only buy his tennis shoes at the Piggly Wiggly local grocery store. The point of my story was that the kid was ashamed of the branding of his bike the branding of his tennis shoes. And the point of my story was that the kid was, should not have been ashamed. He should not have been ashamed of functional things for his own life. The second reason that I remember Mrs. Crutchfield is the same reason for why I'm writing this book Ubuntu as an atonement theology. And it's the same reason for why I am standing here in front of you today. I still have a vivid memory of walking to homeroom where Mrs. Crutchfield would no doubt be waiting at the door, counting and naming each student like little sheep I remember walking to homeroom and being accosted by the collateral violence 
of two of my classmates who were supposed to be walking to homeroom as well, but they were fighting like animals. And students watched, confused between the lure of the entertainment of the fight, as well as the reptilian's brain's response to run. The two black students fighting did not even sound human. They only sound I heard were guttural sounds. I did not know people could make such sounds, people. How could they make such sounds? And this event created a wormhole, a tunnel between my present at that time in 1977 and my future to today. Back then in 1977, I had a decision, an existential decision to make, and it was this. Would I be the Speaker of the House like Tip O'Neill? Or would I be a minister in the church like my grandfather, Jesse, who lived to be 90 years old and who died that same year in 1977, and also in the lineage of my great-grandfather, born in slavery, Grandfather Choi. Would I either be Tip O'Neill or would I be like my ancestors? And I found myself in this conundrum. And no doubt the death of my grandfather caused the conundrum. I found myself in this dilemma, namely my 12-year-old self, reason to himself. Politics has its limits to solving ultimate problems in life and can only relieve the symptoms of the world's diseases. And to my 12-year-old self, still trying to loosen this knot of the conundrum, if God is real, if God is real, becoming a minister would allow me to participate in how God, not only the symptoms, but how God heals the disease. Needless to say, you know the outcome. I never became another Tip O'Neill. But as I have grown older, now 58 years old, I am much more conscious that a fish does not know it is wet, thereby causing my theological worldview to also change, especially when it comes to how God saves the world. I realize now that Daniel's Middle School is not the only one who needs to change its name, and that some approaches to how we name theology have to change as well, especially a theology of atonement. The thesis of the book I'm writing is that instead of retributive justice, which is what runs through most models of the atonement, we need to understand how God saves us through restoration, how our desert mothers and fathers did not long for what was going to happen in the future, but how they longed to return to the garden, to rediscover it, and to realize their surroundings and what they were wet with. I understood, and I understand now, that 
for a healthy theology of atonement, it should advocate for more restorative models for how God saves the world through Jesus Christ. And perhaps it was the seeming dogfight that I saw at Carnage Middle School, the literal carnage of violence repelled me from thinking ret retribution can ever lead to any healing of a disease. All of this was confirmed when I went with my hat in hand to ask Archbishop Tutu if I could write my PhD dissertation on his theology. And doing so caused me to see how a theology of Ubuntu could actually be effective in a dogfight. It turns out now that I understand how Ubuntu matters for how we see the world. And you will discover I focus on spirituality as theology, not because spirituality somehow is a better naming than theology, it is not. As I wrote in my book, my biography on Tutu, the discourse of Christian spirituality can be just as exclusive of black people as theology. I would, I would encourage you to do a Google search, for example, just put in Christian spirituality and you will see mostly white faces emerge. The beauty of Tutu's legacy is that Tutu's Ubuntu spirituality and mysticism, that is what I mean by mysticism, Tutu's prayer life in which he sought direct access to God. In this worldview that Tutu has lived and is his legacy, I was exposed to how apartheid, racism, the rigidity of religion, the formality and the structure and logic of dysfunctional religion has to change. Not just the symptoms, but the core. And for me, such exposure to Tutu broke open the needed change to know what it meant to be a Christian again. And I dare say it as Tutu would, what it means to be human again. With Tutu, I try to go even deeper into the discourse of Christian mysticism because the minute mysticism becomes acceptable discourse, it becomes an immediate threat to organized religious structures. If mysticism has a logic, it is this, that it gives persons direct, unmediated access to God. And some who misinterpret spirituality's practice of God's relationality and mysticism, they go into this unearned direct access to God, which may lead to yet another dysfunction of power a power in which you would say, I don't need you because I've got direct access to God. But Tutu's brilliant witness resists these temptations to chaos, solipsism, and anarchy. In short, I was converted to Ubuntu because it provides a glimpse at what is our ultimate reality, and that is our relationships to one another. Secondly, why Ubuntu? And why Ubuntu to be in the same sentence as Christian spirituality? I favor Christian spirituality because at the heart of its definition is the relationality of God's being. Spirituality contains the eponymous word spirit from which the focus of interdependence is derived. Ubuntu has this similar flow of meaning for how God is known in Christian spirituality, that is a person 
is a person through other persons. That's the theology of the Trinity, and that's the understanding of the Bantus people for what it means to be human, that we are human through each other. And even the theological language of I am is pivotal to the proverb of Ubuntu. I am because we are, and because we are, I am. Ubuntu facilitates a way of not only knowing what it means to be human, but it facilitates a way of knowing God and each other in concert. And Ubuntu spirituality points to relationality and interdependence through which God is present to the world and is crucial for how the world is being saved. If anyone is damned, we all are. Ubuntu teaches this through the glimpse of seeing what we are wet with. Ubuntu gives us this vision of seeing our surroundings and trying not to be influenced to go over a waterfall. The beauty of Ubuntu is that no longer can the image of God be contained in some mythological comic book hero-like way in which when facing suffering, God becomes invulnerable, but once God moves out of that invulnerability, God harrows hell and becomes Hercules and therefore supports my reason for going to war. No longer can we continue to believe these comic book ways of understanding the atonement. And no longer can we understand God's power as violence. God's power becomes crucial for how Tutu envisions the church serving his particular context of South Africa, vying for different versions of God and who are the truly elect of God. Instead of this kind of disorientation, Tutu's affinity for canonic theology encourages him to proclaim God's justice as the act of self-emptying in a corrupted order that already sees itself as just and true. Ubuntu is powerful in that its spirituality of kenosis challenges conventional atonement theologies, but also conventional cultural assumptions that justify dysfunctional practices of political and economic power. In other words, an Ubuntu spirituality provides a theological assertion, not only to be not only to the Christian religious tradition, but to the derivative forms of social power justified by Christianity in the Western world. The Western preoccupation with dominance and coercive power are no doubt linked to and derived from an imperial image of God. And clearly when this discernment of God is challenged the images of coercive national images of God, which take public form, are in deep jeopardy. Christian scripture is full of images against a God of coercion. For example, we see this in Pauline theology in Philippians chapter 2. But we understand ultimately that God's power is known through invulnerability. It's known through vulnerability, not invulnerability. God's power is known through reciprocity. God's power is known in humility. True power that comes from God asks you to be you as you are discovering yourself through me. 
and to exact violence on me is blasphemy because to do so means that the worldview has no space for the image of God as vulnerability. As Karl Barth thought, God is most God on the cross and most human in resurrection. In canonic spirituality, it's difficult to talk about it out loud. It can only really be known through our relationships. As we return back to each other, the reciprocity of who they are, known and loved by God. My last reason for understanding Ubuntu as an atonement theology is because they both go together. And to know how we can be saved is an important correlation. The worldview of Ubuntu is helpful in the Western world by letting the illusion of control be burned away by the reciprocity of spirit. Maggie Ross, who is an anchorite um, and who wrote a wonderful book called The Fountain and the Furnace, is helpful here as she describes the fires of love as infinitely more painful than the fire so-called in hell. If we think about our communities together, if we think about our significant others, if we think about who we are related to, to be in a community is like being in a fire. We easily get irritated with each other. We easily ignite each other. We easily make each other. And our communities can cause two kinds of fire, a fire that purifies, and our communities can also cause a fire that destroys. We understand through an atonement theology the community that God brings is always about restoration, a fire that heals, that purifies. But that fire is not any easier than the fires of hell. And Maggie Ross is important in describing this. On the one hand, when in hell, we can at least try to control reality by telling ourselves we deserve the fires of hell. On the other hand, she writes, the uncontrollable fires of love are what we meet when we turn from our frenzied efforts to create solipsistic worlds and see the silence of looking once again at God. Some fires destroy while others purify because our God is a consuming fire. What I understand from this image is that to live in the image of God is not to be an individual, that's a heresy. The image of God is not an individual. The imago dei is the kind of fire in which we are community. Community is the imago dei. And that can hurt. When we are in community, we struggle not to kill each other, and we fail. When we are in community, we struggle in naming each other, and we often fail. When we are in community, we have the choices of a freedom, not simply of the individual, but the freedom of a community to be diverse, to look like God. We understand through many who taught us that atonement theology needs 
not be about retribution, as Gregory of Nyssa and the Cappadocians help us to see, it need not be about retribution, that the atonement can be about the restoration, not just of a few, not even just of the elect, that atonement can be for everyone. This to me is our challenge today as I look back through the wormhole and see my seventh grade self trying to see who I should be. And I understand that ontology of trying to understand my being in a different way when I think about how to participate in what God is doing. God is not trying to use specialized nuclear weapons. God is not trying to name someone as being less than human. God is not trying to create an economy in which only a few can prosper. God's way of saving the world is right there in front of us. But do we have eyes to see? And the work for us as spiritual leaders, I think, is a work in which we need to return to the hallway inside of Carnage Middle School. And when we come across the collateral damage of those doing violence to themselves, we must be a balm in Gilead. And we must offer ourselves as a way in which when they see us, they are seeing they should not be animals. And then when we return our gaze to them, they should see that they are made in God's image. An Ubuntu theology of the atonement is one in which we live in and from God's love. And it looks like the rite of reconciliation, contrition, confession, forgiveness, repentance, and reunion. And this rite of passage in turn looks like Jesus' kenosis poured through us, thereby requiring our reciprocity with how God saves the world. We must refuse violence. And violence comes in many forms. We must gain a worldview in which we see each other as ourselves. And the beauty of this love that God gives us is that we can actually do that. And the deep longing in humanity to to belong to others reminds us that our control of a solipsistic world can only be partial at best. If we insist that self is all that matters, thereby creating a kind of God set in opposition to the true God, we find ourselves in constant, incessant battle. And even more insidious is that we end up living in the worst kind of punishment, solitary confinement. What is evil in the mystery of how we are nation states, how we are echo chambers? What is evil? God knows. And it shouldn't be us to pontificate in our own echo chambers, in our own nation states, who is more evil. But what we should do is to face the dilemma, the conundrum. Should I participate in healing symptoms or healing the disease? And thanks be to God. I'm preaching to the choir. (laughs) You are here. You know that you do not make much money in this profession that we do. You are here trying to figure out not just 
how to heal the symptoms of the world, but we are asking the existential questions of who we should be and who this world should be. If our worlds are only self-contained, then evil is only defined solipsistically. Namely, there is no substance to evil for those things that happen to anyone else because no one else really matters. Wrong choices, sin as reality is unintelligible if no one else really matters except myself. Of course, the work for us as we leave this place is to understand how a community can be just as difficult as the solipsistic worlds we live in. But that difficulty, that purification, is leading to something greater than ourselves. And like Jesus on the cross, we should not run away from that kind of pain. We should embrace it. 